Hello everyone and welcome back to the Pilot Time channel. My name is Red and today we are back with the second episode of Pilot Time Reads Techno Feudalism by Yanis Varoufakis. So today we are here to start reading the second chapter. In the last episode we read the preface, uh, we read the, the preface, yes, and the first chapter. Um, it was quite fun uh, reading it. It was quite a long episode. I'm not sure how long this one will be, but since it's only one chapter, it should be s shorter, I hope. My goal is to not make these episodes too long since I want, you know, these videos to be as accessible as possible to everybody. So, you know, I'm trying my best to make them short and concise so that people can enjoy them without, you know, being such a daunting task. However, before I do get into the episode, Make sure to uh, check out our links below. If you enjoy our content, um, make sure to support us over on Patreon. If you cannot support us over on Patreon, there are other ways you can support us and check out our website to check out how you can help us without you know relying on money to do so. Uh, of course, also make sure to join our Discord server. If you join our Discord server and also happen to support us over on Patreon, you get access to some special perks like being able to submit questions to our podcast Q&A. Each week we host a podcast uh, where at the end of each episode we try to answer all your questions. And of course, make sure to also support us over at our social media platforms where we keep you updated with the newest stuff going on. We you know if, if something goes wrong with an episode or, or whatever it may be, we always keep everybody informed there. So make sure to follow us on there. And with that being said, let's get into the second chapter of the book. So the second chapter of the book is called Cap uh, Capitalism's Metamorphosis. Um, basically, the way the book is structured, if you haven't watched the first episode, is that the first chapter was a bit of a kind of a, I wouldn't say a throwback, but it kind of told the story of how Yannis kind of got into politics and a bit of a, you know, and a bit of a story with about his dad and now uh, we're actually getting into more of the the topic at hand, I guess. Uh, but the last chapter ended with him basically saying that this book is, um, you know, dedicated to his father and that his father basically had a a question, which was what is like, what, like what is, how is capitalism going to end? Like, how is it impossible to, to overthrow? And what is the Achilles heel of capitalism? And now the first sentence is, uh, is what it is, <laughs> is what is, is the answer, I guess, or at least that's what it seems like. So let's start. Dad, it was capitalism's Achilles heel. After all, the digitally networked technologies that capitalism spawned proved its commandments. The result, humanity is now being taken over by something that I can only describe as a technologically advanced form of feudalism, a techno-feudalism that, that is certainly not what we had hoped would supersede capitalism. I can tell you are puzzled that wherever you look today, capital is triumphant. New moment, monuments to its power spring up everywhere. Physical ones in our cities and across our landscapes. Digital ones on our screens and in our hands. Meanwhile, the digital, the, the capital pores sink deeper into prec precarity and our democracies bend their knee to capital's will. So how dare I even imagine that capitalism is on the way out? that it is being taken over. Have I forgotten that, that nothing strengthen, strengthens capitalism more than the illusion that it is evolving out of existence and into something new? A mixed economy, a welfare state, a global village. No, of course I have not forgotten. Metamorphosis is to capitalism what camouflage is to a chameleon, essence and defense mechanism combined. And yet we are not talking about mere disguise. Several of capitalism's transformations have been epoch changing. One of those was unfolding around the time you were educating me to iron's magic in front of our fireplace. 
And in fact, to explain what I mean by techno-feudalism, I need to first describe in some detail this transformation, capitalism's latest series of metamorphoses, which is the subject of this chapter. Only then, in the next chapter, will I be able to begin to explain properly what has, ha what has replaced it. Sorry. Okay. In an episode of Mad Men, the television, television series on the rise of advertising in the 1960s, the legendary creative director Don Draper coaches his protege, Peggy, on how to think of Hers Hershey, a chocolate bar that their firm is spending. Draper's marketing philosophy perfectly, perfectly encapsulates the spirit of the, of the time. You are the product. You feeling something. James Ponovosky inter, uh, interprets uh, Draper's line in Time magazine. You don't buy a Hershey bar for a couple of ounces of chocolate. You buy it to recapture the feeling of being love that you knew when your dad bought you one uh, for mowing the lawn. The mass commercialization of nostalgia, Draper alludes to, marked a turning point for capitalism. While the big issues of the 1960s were the Vietnam War, civil rights, and the institutions that might civilize uh, capitalism, Medicare, food stamps, the welfare state, Draper was putting his finger on a fundamental mutation in its DNA. Efficiently manufacturing things that people craved was no longer enough. Capital capitalism now involved the skillful manufacturer of desire. Capitalism had begun as a relentless drive to put a price on things that once had no price. Common lands, human labor, all the stuff that families once produced for their own consumption. From bread and home brewed wine to woolly jumpers and various tools. If there was something that humans shared and enjoyed, but which had no price and... Next page... Uh, and matter to us only for its in intrinsic or experimental, experiential, sorry, experiential value, like Granny's handcrafted tablecloth or a beautiful sunset or a be beguiling song. Capitalism found a way to commodify it, subjugate its experiential value to an exchange value. It was in the nature of the beast. Capitalism is synonymous with the triumph of exchange value because it is the only value that can be crystallized into more capital. Just as the Borg in Star Trek depend on assimilating the biological and technological distinctiveness of other species for their survival, capitalism has taken over the planet by assimilating wherever possible any experiential value it encounters into its exchange value chain. Having assimilated every uh, resource, crop, and artifact it could, capitalism has since gone on to commodify the air of waves, women's wombs, art, genotypes, asteroids, even space itself. In the process, the experiential value of all things is reduced to a dollar sum, a commercial asset, a tradable contract. And yet, contrary to Borg's scary greeting, you will be assimilated, resistance is futile. Experiential values, resistance has not been in vain. Each time the onslaught of exchange value has overcome its de defenses, experiential value has gone underground into the catacombs of our psyche. It is there that Don Draper, or more accurately, the men and women madmen, is based on, discovered it, retrieved it, and yes, commodified it. In the process, capitalism changed radically. Watching Mad Men, the audience wonder why the firm pays Draper a mint to do what he does. Mostly horizontal on a comfortable couch in his office, he consumes impressive quantities of bourbon, has a series of breakdowns, behaves erratically and unprofessional, and when he does dine to share what he's thinking, usually offers only critique and disjointed thoughts. But just when you expect him to self-destruct or get fired, he comes up with a magical way of imagining anything from mediocre chocolate and humdrum steel products to second-rate hamburger restaurant chain, chains in ways that make them emotionally resonant and inst intensely desirable. 
In both aspects of his behavior, Draper captures the essence of capitalism's post-war transformation, the discovery of a new market, namely the market for our attention, grafted onto a shiny new industrial structure, but all within a system that, that remains fully reliant on labor's dual nature. For the dual nature of Draper's labor is writ larger in every episode of Mad Men. His bosses would love to be able to purchase his ideas without having to tolerate him lounging around the office half drunk. In the language of the previous ch chapter, they would jump at the opportunity to buy Draper's experiential labor directly, only they can't, they couldn't even if he wanted to sell it to them. Instead, they are focused to buy his commodity labor, i.e. his time and potential, in the hope that during his embryated days, his genius will sp spontaneously deliver the, frame, the famed Draper magic. And when it does, their immense profits confirm once again that capital is born out of the capitalist's inability to buy experiential labor directly. Draper's genius, meanwhile, is to grasp and to confront the paradox of commodification. Yes, capitalism must commodify everything it touches, but at the same time, high exchange value and thus serious profits depend on failing to do so fully. It is to avoid the fate of school of pred predators that devours its prey so efficiently that it starves to death. Capitalism relies on there being an endless su supply of experiential value for its exchange value to tra trance and cannibalize. It must always be discovering and commodifying what has so far escaped it. Smart advertisers do exactly that. They tap, in, they tap into emotions that have previously escaped commodification in order to capture our attention. And then they sell our attention to an entity whose business is to commodify whatever experiential value has hidden in our souls, fleeing commodification. With his Hershey bar speech, Draper lays bare a crucial aspect of how soon after the war capitalism reached its golden age. How could the profits keep flowing once everything has seemingly been commodified already? Draper's answer, through the triggering of uncommodification emotions deep inside us. Thus a Hershey bar come, becomes the simulacrum of a dead father's ca caress. Bethlehem steel is rebranded as the spirit of America's polis, with the steel product symbolizing the new world's own iron age. When Draper and Peggy visit a burger chef, burger chef outlet, they discern the possibility of a television advertisement that promotes the chain as an opportunity for families to be reunited around its plastic table, away from the family home where togetherness is no longer possible because everyone's attention has been arrested by the television. So what did capitalism look like before this great transformation occurred? And how did this transformation take place? Another way to ask the same question would be, where did Sterling Cooper and Partners, Draper's f uh, fictional firm, find the money or willingness to treat him like an uh, academic? To pay him good money to think deeply at the pace of his choosing. Capitalism's early advocates would have been perplexed. Their idea of entrepreneurship took the form of parmonious bakers, butchers, and brewers eagerly striving to satisfy their customers' basic needs by working hard, thinking on their feet, economizing on everything, squeezing the last drop of exchange value out of any raw materials they could lay their hands on. What a change that meant a character like Draper could become an icon for, for our enterprise culture. I think you will like my answer, that electromagnetism. Once James Clerk Maxwell had written down the equations linking electrical current to magnetic forces, it was only, time, only a matter of time before someone like Thomas Edison would turn them into the electricity and telegraph grids that ultimately begat the networked, top-down megacorporations we know today. Pushing the bakers, butchers, and brewers of early capitalism to the sidelines. The problem was that none of capitalism's early institutions, especially the banks and share markets, were ready for such corporate and em empires. Sorry. 
Simply put, the banks were too small and too fragile, and the share markets too thin, too illiquid, to provide the kind of funds Edison needed to build his famous Pearl Street power station, let alone the rest of his electricity grid. To produce the river of credit necessary to fund the, Ed the Edisons, the Westinghouses, and the Fords of early 20th century capitalism, small banks emerged to form large ones and lent either to the industrialists directly or to speculators eager to buy shares in the new corporations. That's how electromagnetism transformed capitalism. While its grid would go on to power mega firms and its megawatts translated into mega profits, it would also create the first mega debts in the form, uh, the form, sorry, the form of yes, vast overdraft facilities for the Edisons, the Wessington houses, and the Fords, and it led to the emergence of big finance, which grew up alongside big business in order to lend its monies, borrowed eff effectively from the future. From profit not yet realized, but which big business promised to deliver. These wagers on future profits funded not only the construction of big businesses' grids and production lines, but almighty froth of speculation as well. Parsimony was out and largesse became the new virtue. The Victorian belief that firms would be small and powerless so that competition could perform its magic of keeping entrepreneurs honest was replaced by the creed that what is good for big business is good for America. The, ja the jazz age swept restraint away. Depp's dirty name was cleansed in the torrents of anticipated profits. Caution was thrown out of the winds of credit. Within a decade, electromagnetism had sparked the Roaring Twenties, whose inevitable heart-wrenching crash came in the 1929. In 1929, the year the grapes of wrath began to fill and grow heavy for the vintage. Whether one believes that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal ended the Great Depression or that it was the war that did it, one thing is clear. The New Deal also changed global capitalism, global capitalism profoundly. The New Deal's public works projects, its social welfare programs, and above all, its public finance instruments, together with the string, stringent controls over the bankers, could get away with constituted a full-on dress wrestle for the war economy. For immediately after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor brought the U.S. into the Second World War, the, U the U.S. government began to emulate the Soviet one. It told factory owners how much to produce and to what specifications, from aircraft carriers to processed food. It even employed a prize czar, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith. Galbraith, Braith, I think that's how you read it, whose job literally was to decide the price of everything, to fend off inflation, and to ensure a smooth economic transition from wartime to peacetime. It, was, it is no exaggeration to say that American capitalism was run according to Soviet planning principles, with the important exception that the network factories remained under the private ownership of big business. Under President Roosevelt, the U.S. government's deal with the big business was simple. They would produce what was necessary to win the war, and in exchange, the state would reward them with four incredible gifts. First, state gar guaranteed sales, transla translating into state guaranteed profits. Second, freedom from competition, since prices were fixed by government. Third, the third, huge government-funded scientific research example, the Manhattan Project, Jet Propulsion, that provided big business with wonderful new innovations and a pool of highly skilled scientific personnel to recruit from during uh, and after the war. And fourth, a patriotic aura to help rinse off the stench of corporate greed that clung to them after the crash of 1929 and make them over as heroic enterprises that helped America win the war. The war economy experiment was an unqualified success. 
Production quadrupled in less than five years. Inflation was kept on a leash, unlike what had happened during the previous world war. Unemployment disappeared and was kept at bay even after the soldiers, sailors and airmen returned from the front. The, to big business, it was a dream come true that compensated them handsome, handsomely, handsomely for the subjugation of big finance to the government's plan and strictures. Beneath the surface, however, the heat of war had transformed American capitalism at a molecular level, just as the heart of our fireplace had transformed iron into steel. By the war's end, American capitalism was unrecognizable. Business and government had become profoundly entwined. Indeed, the revolving doors between government and departments and corporations saw it that the same crowd of mathematic, mathematicians, scientists, analysts, and professional managers populated them both. Their heroic entrepreneur at the helm of the corporation and the democratically elected politician at the head of, go at the, head of the government had both been usurped by this new private-public decision-making network, whose value and properties Indeed, its survival boiled down to one thing, the survival and growth of the, the conglomerates now that the war with its infinite demand for stuff and technologies was over. Galbraith called this nexus the techno structure. Profitability remained essential for the army of technicians and influences wielding employees making up the techno structure. Nevertheless, profit was no longer their top priority, as with a, a all bureaucracies, their primary goal was to keep their underlying employed and busy. This meant they had not merely to avoid the shrinking of their conglomerates at the war's end, but to grow them. With the war behind them, one question kept the good folks of the techno structure up at night. If the government would no longer guarantee sales and prices, where would they find enough customers ready and willing to pay for all the chocolate bars, cars, and washing machines that they were planning to manufacture using the capacity hitherto dedicated to producing bullets, machine guns, and flamethrowers? The new dealers in government took it upon themselves to help the technostructure secure foreign customers, which, as we shall see, triggered another of the great metamorphoses of 20th century capitalism. But as for domestic customers, there, that's where Don Draper came in. His stock in trade, opening the technostructure's eye to the boundless impossibilities of founding a new market for our attention to a, a bed of raw emotion. The technostructure had the manufacture of things fully under its control. With Draper's help, it could now look forward to manufacturing the necessary desire for them. Paying Draper a large salary to lounge around for most of the working day was a small price to pay for such an extra, extraordinary power. On a cold January day in 1903, in front of a large audience at Coney Island's Luna Park, Thomas Edison used alternating current to electrocute to death Topsy, a helpless elephant. His purpose? To draw the attention, uh, the public's attention to the deadliness of the type of, te of electricity pledged by War George Westinghouse, his competitor. Despite the novel awfulness, nothing significantly new had happened. A powerful man had used the old age old trick of grabbing the public's attention to sell himself as and his offerings. From a peacock, peacock's feathers to a Roman emperor's triumphal march to the fashion industry of today, competing for others' attention is about as old as sexual reproduction. But it wasn't until the 20th century that the process of attention grabbing was commodified. Once again, it was electromagnetism that achieved this revolutionary feat, not by killing an elephant, but by allowing for the invention of the radio and even more importantly, the television set. At first, radio and television gave big business a headache. It offered them immense opportunities to engage and persuade the masses, but fundamentally its 
output the programs it broadcasts had the properties of sunset rather than a tin of beans. However, much you loved watching I Love You Lucy on TV, and even if you were prepared to pay good money to watch it, no one had the capacity to make you pay for it, at least not before cable TV was introduced. But this stopped being a problem once they realized that the program was not the, commod the commodity. It was the attention of the people watching it. By broadcasting the program for free, they could secure the audience's attention, allowing them to sell to it to that whoa, whoa, allow them then to sell it in the form of advertisement breaks to Draper's clients who were now so eager to instill new desires in the hearts of the American public. With the birth of commercial television, the techno structure appended a boisterous attention market to its labor market. The dual nature of labor was now coupled with the dual nature of the spectacle. On the one hand, a cultural product with large experiential value, but no exchange value. And on the other hand, capture the attention of viewers with substantial exchange value, but no experiential value. The culture impact was enormous, but with the, with the less visible impact was no less monumentous. A new group of experts had been crafted onto the technostructure. Along with the scientists, analysts, and professional managers, there was now creative types like Draper, as well as a whole raft of strategists and engineers working on new ways to manipulate and commodify our attention. It was another historic transformation. By the early 1960s, the commodities that made real money were no longer the ones that pre prevailed in some Darwinian struggle for exchange for existence, sorry, within some competitive market. No, the products that adorned every home were the ones that the, that the drapers and the executives of the conglomerates fashioned together in meetings at the Technostructure skyscraper, skyscraper offices. There, over lots of smoking and drinking, they jointly decided the prices, the quantities, the packages, and even the feeling imparted by capitalism's lending products. Whereas capitalism had come to life by turning feudalism's societies with markets <clears throat> into decentralized market societies, the rise of technostructure transformed American capitalism from a decentralized market society into a centralized economy with markets. It was precisely what the Soviet planners had always hoped to achieve but failed. And there's the irony. In the 1960s, a dedicated market by an ideological and nuclear clash between America and the Soviet Union that almost blew up the world, Soviet planning principles were implemented with remarkable success in the United States. Irony was seldom taken a more effective revenge over earnest ideology. That was as far as the techno structures the domestic customers went, those within the USA. What about the rest of the world? It was all very well converting America's factories from fa manufacturing tanks, ammunition, finger uh, fighter planes, sorry, and uh, aircraft carriers to crunching out washing machines, cars, televisions, sets, and passenger jets. The problem was that America's industrial capacity had grown so much during the war that to keep its factories busy and its workers in jobs, they had to pr produce a lot more stuff than Americans alone could absorb. Drilling new desires into the American con consumers could never be enough because there were not enough American middle-class homes to do the necessary consuming. Foreign markets had to be found. I remember one evening in 1975 you came home with extraordinary news. 30 drachmas were no longer enough to buy us one American dollar, you announced. That, not that it made any difference to us, since we had neither the means nor the legal right to buy more than a handful of dollars, but you were anxious that an exchange rate had stood still since 1957, had just broken down. What did that mean for our future as a family and for our small country, where the American shockwaves could, by grand ruptures, 
originating the, in American usually took a while to hit. Thinking back, your hunch was exactly right. This was indeed a local rever reverberation of something that originated in the U.S. and that augurated a violent and, at this time, global metamorphosis of capitalism. The breakdown of the drachma dollar exchange rate that had so impressed you was a consequence of the downfall four years earlier in 1971 of the so-called Brenton Woods system, as with the 2008 financial crisis, which took two long years to flatten, Greece, the collapse of Brenton Wood also took some time to hit us. A German friend once quipped, if I hear that the end of the world is nigh, I shall immediately move to Greece. Everything takes a couple of years longer over there. Brenton Woods was the audacious global financial system devised by the New Dealers in 1944, whose purpose was noble, to thrash the Great Depression's return after the war had ended. Its strategy, however, was perhaps less so. It aimed to append post-war Europe and Japan to America's gleaming new war economy. The New Dealers knew that once the Germany armies had been defeated, Europe would lie in ruins, its people penniless. So Washington understood that its first task would be to monetize Europe, literally to provide them with money to spend in order to get their economies running again. That was easier said than done. With Europe's gold either spent or stolen, its factories and infrastructure turned into rubble, hordes of refugees roaming its highways and byways, the construction camps will still reek with the stenches of humanity's unspeakable cruelty. Europe needed much more than freshly minted paper money. Something had to instill the new notes with value. After all, what gives any currency value but the economy that stands behind it? Only one thing could circumvent the problem, the dollar. The financial project of the Brentwood uh, system was bold. The dollar rise, the currency of Europe and Japan, by linking European currencies and the yen to the dollar with fixed exchange rates. Hence, the 30 drachmas to $1 whose demise disturbed you in 1975. In essence, it was a global currency union based on the US dollar. With the mighty US economy standing behind them, the currencies would retain a significant and stable value. Naturally, there had to be limits to how many dollars one could get for one's funny money, Greek drachmas, Italian lire, etc. These limits were known as capital controls, restrictions in the movement of money from one currency to another. They made the lives of the bankers wonderfully boring by denying them the opportunity to speculate on shifts in the relative value of currencies, which they would otherwise have done by shifting large quantities of money from one currency to another, from one country to another. That was, of course, intentional, Having been burned by the, 19, the 1929 catastrophe, the New Dealers wanted bankers to live in a straitjacket of capital control and almost fixed interest rates with only tiny wiggle room of 1% here or there. The East and the New Dealers wrote the Japanese constitution and oversaw its transformation into a techno structure with the Japanese characteristics. In Europe, they guided the foundation of the European Union as a cartel of heavy industry centered upon German manufacturing, adapting their techno structures blueprint to European circumstances. To make this happen, they had to rewrite the German constitution and with promises of handing administrative and political oversight over to Paris, throughout the French ambition to de-industrialize Germany. This dazzling design, America's global plan to remake Europe and Japan in the image of its technostructure, led to capitalism's golden age. From the war's end until 1971, America, Europe, and Japan enjoyed low employment, low inflation, high growth, and massively diminishing, diminished inequality. The New Dealer's job was almost done.
and it was done in a way that even the staunchest republic moguls appreciated turning to a madman for one more symbolic insight there was a scene from conrad hilton the hotel mogul shares with don draper his true ambition which encapsulates the spirit of this golden plan this global plan sorry it's my purpose in life to bring america to the world wherever they like it or not you know we are a force of good don because we have god whether the scriptwriter meant God as a stand-in for the dollar or not, it is fair to say that American hegemony in this era re relied on the almighty power of its currency, the only currency everyone wanted, even if they never cared to buy anything coming from America. But all this relied on one crucial factor, for the dollar to be the apple of everyone's eyes. At the fixed exchange rates, the Burton Woods system guaranteed, America had to be a surplus, amazing country, meaning it had to sell more goods and services to the rest of the world than it imported. Of course, selling goods to their Europeans and Japanese was more than just a business outcome. It was how the techno structure world secure for itself the vast new markets it needed to sustain its industries and kept its economy growing. But the whole system was relying on its surplus integrally, for it was what ensured that the dollar imprinted by the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, and given to the Europeans and to the Japanese, either as loans or aid, would ultimately find their way back to the, European, to the United States in return for U.S. goods. With every Boeing jet or General Electric washing machine sold to the Europeans, a bundle of dollars would head home back across the Atlantic. And as long as migratory dollars were gravitating back home, the dollar would remain a steal at a given exchange rate, guaranteeing the Germans, the British, the French, the Japanese, even the Greeks wanted to get many more dollars for their funny money than the authorities allowed them to at the official exchange rate. As long as America was the major surplus nation, Burton Woods was safe as, as houses. And that's why, by the late 1960s, the Burton Wood system was dead in the water. The reason? Three developments which caused America to lose its trade surplus and became a chronically deficient, uh, deficit economy. Sorry, I read that wrong. The first was the escalating Vietnam War, which forced the U.S. government to spend billions in Southeast Asia on supplies and services for its military. The second was President Lyndon Johnson's attempt to make amends for the ill effects of uh, conscription on working class America, its black communities in particular. His valiant but excessive Great Society program substantially reduced poverty but at once sucked a lot of important goods from Japan and Europe into the United States. Lastly, Japan's and Germany's factories surpassed America's both in terms of quality and efficiency, partly due to the support successive U.S. governments had extended to Japanese and Germany's manufacturing sectors, the car industry being an obvious example. Never too slow to accept reality, Washington killed off its finest creation. On 15th August 1971, President Nixon announced the ejection of European and Japanese from the dollar zone. Brenton Woods was dead. The door had been opened to a new and truly dismal phase in capitalism's evolution. In 2002, 30 years after the Nixon shock, humanity's total income approximated $50 trillion. In the same year, financiers around the world had wagered $70 trillion on a variety of bets. I remember your eyes popping out when you heard this outrageous number. Like most, you refused to wrap your mind around it. Used to thinking of money in terms of things that made sense, like tons of steel or the number of hospitals it could build, you could not see how much Earth was large enough to contain that 70 trillion number. A uh, 70 trillion dollar number, sorry. By 2007, humanity's total income had risen from uh, 50 dollars uh, to 75 trillion dollars a decent 33% increase from five years. But the sum of bets in the global mar uh, money market had gone up. 
from holy sh from 70 to 70 uh, sorry from 70 to 750 trillion dollars a rise in ex excess of 10 uh, th uh, in a thousand percent that's when i lost you or more accurately it is when we agreed that the number had gone mad an arithmetic reflection of capitalism's hubris that's a huge number holy crap even i got shocked <laughs> didn't know that how had these mad numbers come about what drove them one way to answer this question is technical it involves a description of financial instruments such as options or derivatives the weapons of potential mass financial destruction as warren buffett called them which were the occasion if not the cause of the immense financial bubble that burst in the cal calamity of 2008 these instruments, known as options, had been available under Bretton Woods, but it was only once Bretton Woods had died that bankers, liberal, liberated from their New Deal chains, were allowed to bet on the shock, stock exchange, Sorry, first with other people's money and then later with money. Effectively conjured from thin air, lent in astronomical sums by the banks too, themselves. Conjured from thin air, to be, clear, to be clear, yes, most people think that bankers take Jill's savings and lend them back to Jack. That's not what banks do. When a bank lends Jack money, it does not go in, in, on, into its vault to check it has enough cash to back the loan. If it believes Jack will return the loan plus the agreed interest, all the bank needs to do is add to Jack's account the number of dollars it lends him. Nothing more than a typewriter or today a few keystrokes on a keyboard are necessary. Now if the Jacks of the world use their loans judiciously to make enough money to repay the loans plus the interest as well, it, all is well, sorry. But it is in the nature of banks to accommodate too many jacks eager to borrow increasing amounts to keep paying each other more and more, whilst the banks collect huge profits from funding such a giant Ponzi scheme. Inevitably, this financial house of cards collapses, at which point the little people are crushed by global capitalism's failing debris, as witnessed in the aftermath of 1929. Brenton Woods was designed to prevent such greed-fueled recklessness from bringing humanity to the brink of another Great Depression, indeed another world war, ever again. But once it was gone, the bankers were free to run amok, again. Knowing you, your habitual risk aversion, and your reluctance to assume that powerful people are stupid, you would find this explanation unsatisfying. If you and I are clever enough to recognize the inherent inability of their financial house of cards, surely the bankers will recognize it too. So why were they not terrified of what would happen if their various bets went south? There are a number of reasons. One is that they had developed a new way of profiting from loaning to Jack without depending on Jack's ability or willingness to repay his loan. The trick was to lend Jack to Jack, then immediately spl splice his loan into tiny pieces of debt and sell these pieces on inside multiple very complex financial products to, an, uh, to unsuspecting buyers far away, who would themselves repackage and sell them on to someone else, <clears throat> and so on. This practice lulled Western bankers into a false sense of safety. Jack's loan was no longer their problem. Even if Jack defaulted his loan, had been cut into so many tiny pieces that no single banker would, he would bear to burn it off. The risk had been shared and dismantled and thus minimized their belief. Having internalized this belief, they were able to internalize another. Prudence was for wimps and that smart people like themselves were actually giving capitalism a helpful boost. But by producing more and more debt, splicing it up in smaller and smaller pieces and dispersing it across the planet, they were not minimizing the risk, they were compounding it. 
Ruin loomed large over the horizon, but financiers were simply unable to imagine that all these tiny pieces of debt on which the West's financial system rested could crash in unison. Why, you ask? If this was so obvious to us, why did the supermarket bankers not consider the high probability of simultaneous def defaults? Of all the bank, of all the pieces, sorry, of that issue to the various jacks going south all at once. To say that the bankers did not see this coming because they were caught up in a whirlwind of unchecked greed is to rephrase the question, not to answer it. Greed was not born in, 19, in the 1980s. No, something else happened after the Nixon shock killed off Brenton Woods. Something that helped the gamblers' madness in effect. Wall Street magnified greed in the process, generating these mad numbers. Whatever that something was, it must have been substantial, judging by its earth-shattering consequence. It shifted capitalist power from the economic sphere, i.e. from the in industries and commerce, to the financial sphere, to the world of the bankers. What was it? You will be pleased to hear that the answer, my answer, evokes an ancient myth. A myth. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Once upon a time in the famous maze-like labyrinth of the Cretan King's palace, there lived a creature as fierce as it was tragic. Surviving in the intense loneliness, comparable only to the fear it inspired far and wide, the Minotaur had a voracious appetite. Satisfying it was essential to maintaining the peace that King Menos had enforced, allowing the trade to crisscross the seas, spreading prosperity, benevolent reach to all. Alice, the beast's appetite, could only be satisfied by human flesh. Every now and then, a ship loaded with youngsters sailed from far away Athens bound for Creta. On arrival, it would deliver its human tribute to be devoured by the Minotaur. A gruesome ritual, albeit one that preserved the era's peace and reproduced its prosperity. Millennia later, another Minotaur rose up, surreptitiously from the ashes of the Brentwood system. Its lair, a form of labyrinth, lay deep in the guts of America's economy. It began life as the U.S. trade deficit. The fact that America began to buy more imports from another country than it sold, to them owing to the Vietnam War, the Great Society, and the expanding efficiency of German and Japanese factories. The tributes it consumed was the rest of the world's exports, imported from Europe and Asia to be devoured in middle America's malls. The more the U.S. deficit grew, the greater the Minotaur's appetite for Europe's and more so Asia's manufactured goods. However, what gave it strength and global significance? What meant that it ensured the peace and prosperity, not just in America, but in Europe and Asia too? Were the Lambertine underground tunnels connecting Walmart to Wall Street? The way it worked was as follows. The new American Minotaur's appetite kept the gleaming German factories busy. It globbed up everything produced in Japan and later in China. This kept Europe and Asia peaceful and prosperous for now. In return, the foreign and often the American owners of these distant factories sent their profits, their cash back to Wall Street to be invested. An additional form of tribute, which enriched America's ruling class, despite its deficit. In this way, the global minotaur helped recycle financial capital, profits, savings, surplus money, and the rest of the world's uh, net exports. Nourished on this constant stream of goods, it enabled and sustained the post Burton Woods global order, such, such as its cretin predecessors had prevented Pax Cretana in these myths of prehistory. This was a strategy that laid behind the Nixon shock of 15 August 1971, and it, was work, and it worked wonders, at least for those who triggered it. You see, the writing had been on the wall from Brenton Woods since the late 
uh, to the mid to late 1960s. As Americans' trade surplus began turning into a deficit, financiers began anticipating its demise. They knew that sooner or later, the dollar gold exchange rate artificially set in 1944 at a fixed uh, $35 per ounce would depreciate. At that point, their stashes of dollars would buy less gold. Naturally, they began to eagerly exchange the dollars for American gold before that happened. This and the, uh, had this continued, the United States would have run out of gold. The Nixon shock stopped the rot. The dollar depreciated fast vis-a-vis -vis gold as anticipated, but curiously, that was the moment the dollar regained its mojo. How? Shortly after the dollar was decoupled from gold, Europe's currency were decoupled from the dollar. Once they, they lost their fixed exchange with the dollar, the dollar value of European and Japanese money began fluctuating wildly, like driftwood in a temp tempestuous ocean. The dollar became the only safe harbor, currency of its ex exorbitant priv privilege. Namely, if any French, Japanese, or Indonesian company, indeed any one, wanted to import oil, copper, steel, or even just space on a freight ship, they had to pay in dollars. The United States was therefore the only country in the world whose currency was in demand, even by people who did not want to buy anything from it. That's why, as dark, a dark cloud of uncertainty depended upon Europe's and Japanese and uh, Europe's and Japan, sorry, economic future, the world of finance responded by hammering to turn their savings into dollars. Suddenly, the dollar became the king and queen again. The Nixon shock had produced a magic trick for the ages. The country going deeper and deeper into the red was the country whose currency, the dollar, was becoming more and more hegemonic. It was the epitome of paradox. The tumult unleashed by Nixon gave the world's capitalists a strong impetus to dollarize their profits. It was to become an unmissable pattern. To this day, whenever Wall Street tanks, the money's main reaction is to buy more dollars to send to Wall Street. But there was another reason the dollar's hegemony grew. The intentional improvisation of America's working class. The cynic will tell you quite accurately the large quantities of money are attracted to countries where the profit rate is higher. For Wall Street to exercise fully its magnific powers of over foreign capital, profit margins in the US had to catch up with profit rates in Europe and Japan. A quick and dirty way to do this was to suppress American wages. Cheaper labor makes for lower costs, makes for larger margins. It is no coincidence that to this day, American working class earnings languish on average below their 1974 level. It is also no coincidence that the union busting became a thing in the 1970s, culminating in the Ronald Reagan's dismissal of every single unionized air traffic controller a move emulated by Margaret Thatcher in Britain who pulverized whole industries in order to eliminate the trade unions that inhabited them. And faced with a minotaur sucking most of the world's capital into America, the European ruling classes reckoned they had no alternative but to do the same. Reagan had to set the pace. Thatcher had shown the way. But it was in Germany, and later across continental Europe, that the new class war, you might call it universal austerity, was waged most effectively. A new era had begun. The post-war Dante between capital and labor was now into its death throes. The final straw became, came in 1991 with the demise of the Soviet Union, where after Russia and more importantly China revolutionary inducted themselves into a globalized capitalism. Two billion low-wage workers entered the Minotaur's realm. Western wages stagnated further. Profits swelled, the torrent of capital rushing to America to nourish the beast growing into a tsunami. And it was the tsunami of capital rushing towards the United States that gave the bankers of Wall Street the confidence, indeed, the insane hubris, to conjure the mad numbers that you found so incomprehensible.
he's right. I did find them incomprehensible. In fact, I even had trouble reading them. The question I now hear you asking is perhaps the most important one of all. Why did Nixon not try to save Bretton Woods? Even while devaluing the dollar vis-a-vis -vis gold, he could have kept the restrictions on the bankers in place. He could have preserved the dollar's fixed exchange rates with Europe's and Japan's currencies. What inspired this dramatic vault phase among the rulers of the techno structure? It is 1965. Flower, power, and make love, not war, are in the air. Going against the grain, Don Draper explains his theory of love to a date. What you call love was invented by guys like me to sell nylons. The fictional character, who I insist personifies the techno structure spirit, enlisted exaggerated cynic cynicism to make a point having created desires and expectations that ultimately its consumers products could not actually satisfy and well before its economic foundation was trampled upon by the rampaging minotaur the techno structure was facing a backlash indicative of a society-wide spiritual crisis the vietnam war did much to radicalize the young after 1965 However, the young had been returning against their parents' establishment and inviting the generation gap years before President Johnson escalated the war in Indochina. The discontent was ignited by the war, but it was not caused by it. So why did Americans in Europe's young rise up in the mid to late 60s at a time of full employment, sharply diminished inequality, new public universities, and all the tramp, uh, trappings of an expanding welfare state. Talking to himself in another episode, Draper offers an answer in the front form of the harshest self-criticism possible by a man who has dedicated his life to manufacturing desire. We are flawed because we want so much more. We are ruined because we get these things and wish for what we had. It is more one thing for our dreams to go unfulfilled. It is quite another to sense that our unfulfilled dreams, our frustrated desires have been manufactured by others. The more our mass produced cravings are satisfied, the less satiated we feel. The greater the capacity of the technostructure to stir the passions, the greater the void within when they were served. To fill this void, young people felt in their bones the need to break with this established order, to rebel without a well-defined cause, to proclaim their moral outrage at the technostructure's way. The May 1968 uprisings Woodstock, even the fevers with which the young threw themselves into the civil rights campaign, smacked of the rebelliousness that usually foreshadows a fin de siècle, the end of a regime, and its replacement with something new. The young rebels who rejected the technostructure's audacity to plan everything, their desires included, were not alone in feeling discontent. In the 1950s and 60s, had been a nightmare for true believers in the capitalism as a natural system of spontaneous order. Wherever they turned their eyes, they saw centralized planning, not the splendid operation of free willing market forces that no planner, however well meaning, should be able to second guess. Even if innocent of the way the techno structure was manufacturing desires and fixing prices, they could not help but notice the long hand of the state directing investment funds, preventing bankers from moving money, and fixing the dollar value of every other currency, including our drachma. <clears throat> to their free marketeer eyes, the global plan was too close to Soviet planning for comfort. The West was, in short, psychologically prepared for a rupture like the Nixon shock. Anti-capitalist youth and free market zealots were both looking for a chance to bring down what they saw as a dying system. In the end, though it was neither the hippie left nor the libertarian right that disintegrated the global plan, it was the work of the functionaries who had served the techno structure well. We know this from the horse's mouth, the former New Dealer who was, the, uh, who was at the center of the 1971 Nixon shock and who between 1979 and 1987 chaired America's central bank, the Fed. 
In a 1978 speech at Warwick University, Paul Volcker explained succinctly and cynically what they were up to. A. Controlled in this, uh, disintegration in the world economy is a legitimate objective for the 1980s. That's exactly what the Nixon shock was meant to do. Just a controlled implosion brings down an unwanted skyscraper. Burton Woods was demolished to make way for America's global minotaur. Lest you have any doubts, Volcker own, own words from the same Warwick speech say it well. Say it all, sorry. Balancing the requirements of a stable international system against the desirability of retaining freedom of action. For national policy, a number of countries, including the United States, opted for the latter. Where once stood the most stable global capitalist system ever, folks like Volcker were enthusiastically erecting the most unstable international system possible, founded on ceaselessly, ceaselessly sorry, ballooning def, def, deficits, debts, and gambles. Their controlled disintegration of Burton Woods would soon complete the new global system. Most people refer to it as globalization or fiscalization. Under the perhaps ex excessive influence of our taste for the ancient parables, I call it capitalism's global minotaur phase. The controlled disintegration of the old plant system and its replacement with, a, with the recalcitrant minotaur was always going to hurt American workers. After decades of hard, step by agonizing step slog up the socioeconomic ladder, they were unceremoniously thrown off it and back to the pit of subsistence wages. How else could ever increasing American deficits coexist with reinforced US hegemony and a fabulously richer American elite? In practice, Volcker's controlled the disintegration of the old system required beyond the neutering of trade unions and re uh, engineering recession in order to reduce workers' bargaining power and the elimination of the shackles that President Roosevelt had slapped on the bankers to restrain their recklessness. These were the prerequisites for the Minotaur's rise, but they were also big political asks with a worldwide repercussion. As with every systemic transformation that hurts countless people, the cruelties necessary to bring it about had to be bathed in the light of liberating, redemptive ideology. That's where neoliberalism came in. Neither new nor liberal, neoliberalism was an interesting hodgepodge of older political philosophies. As a piece of theory, it had as much to do with really existing capitalism as Mar Marxism had to do with really existing communism. Nothing. Nevertheless, neoliberalism delivered the necessary ideology veneer to <clears throat> legitimize the assault on organized labor and to promote the so-called deregulation that let, uh, that let Wall Street rip. Along with it came the revival of economic theories that humanity had rightfully ditched during the Great Depression. Theories artfully assuming that which they claim to explain, such as the grand lie that deregulated mar financial markets know best. Around the same time in the late 1970s, the first personal computer began to enter engineering, architecture, and of course finance. The joke then was that to err is human, but to mess things up, seriously, one needs a computer. Sadly, in high finance, it was no joke. When earlier I gave the most cursory explanation of the financial options or derivatives that were the occasion of the 2008 crash, you saw immediately that they were primed for destruction. All it took was a downturn in the underlying pr share prices. Why could the financiers not see this? My previous answer, that logic was trumped by f profit taking, was the truth, but not the whole truth. The missing part of the answer, computers. Computers allowed financiers to complicate their gambling immediately. Instead of a simple option to sell boring old chairs to Jill, Jack could now buy much snazzier options called derivatives. For example, he could buy a derivative that was in essence an option to buy a bundle containing shares in a variety of different companies plus bits of debt owned by homeowners in Kentucky, German corporations, even the Japanese government. As if that were not complex enough, Jack could also buy a derivative amounting to the option to buy a bundle of many such derivatives that some supercomputer would create. 
By the time these derivatives containing other derivatives had come out of the computer, not even the genius financial engineer who created them could understand what was in them. Complexity thus became a great excuse not to delve into the derivatives that one bought. Liberated the Jills and Jacks from the need to explain themselves why they were buying them. Once computers had a guarantee that no one could possibly understand what these derivatives were made of, everyone wanted to buy them because everyone was buying them. And as long as everybody was buying, anyone who could borrow huge amounts of money could become a billionaire and avoid being branded a coward or a party pooper or a loser by one's colleagues, simply by purchasing, purchasing them. For years, that's exactly what was happening, until in 2008 it wasn't. As a brief side note, you may well ask, when the bubble finally burst, why did we not let the bankers crash and burn? Why weren't they held accountable for their absurd debts? For two reasons. First, because the payments system, the simple means of transferring a sum of money from one amount, one account sorry, to another on which every transaction relies, is monopolized by the very same bankers who were making the bets. Imagine having gifted your arteries and veins to a gambler. The moment he loses big at the casino, he can blackmail you for anything you have simply by threatening cut off in your circulation. Second, because the financiers, gambles, contained deep inside the title deeds to the houses of the ma majority. A full-scale financial market collapse would therefore lead to mass homelessness and a complete breakdown in the social construct. Don't be surprised that the high and mighty financiers of Wall Street could bother financializing the modest homes of poor people, having borrowed as much as they could off banks and rich clients in order to place their crazy bets they craved more, since the more they bet, the more they made. So they created more debt from scratch to use a raw material for more debt. How? By lending to impecunious blue-collar workers who dreamt of the security of owning their own home. What if these little people could not actually afford their mortgages in the medium term? In contrast to bankers of old, the Jills and Jacks who now lend them money did not care if the, repay if the repayments were made because they never intended to collect. Instead, having granted the mortgages, they put it into their computerized grinder, chopped it up digitally into tiny pieces of debt, and repackaged them into one of their limerentine derivatives, which they would then sell at a profit. By the time the poor homeowner had defaulted and her home was repossessed, the financer who granted the loan in the first place had long since moved on. Back in the 1980s, I remember a famous economist saying sarcastically that everywhere he looked, he saw the productivity gains brought on by computers. Everywhere, he continued, except in the productivity statistics. He was right. Just as the early generation of computers saved no paper, since we tend to print anything important out often twice, so too did little to boost industrial output. But the computer did have an enormous impact on finance. It multiplied the complexity of financial instruments by hiding the ugliness within them. And it allowed for their frantic trading to accelerate almost to the speed of light. Can you now see how, by 2007, the world of finance had managed to place bets worth 10 times more than humanity's total income? Three were the, ha the handmaidens of this motivated madness. The torrents of money rushing to the American Minotaur, the computer-generated complexity of the financial derivatives, and the neoliberal faith that markets know best. Not that computers speak to each other. Will this network make capitalism impossible to overthrow? Or might it finally reveal its Achilles heel? You have been extremely patient with me. Everything in this chapter was danced around your question, offering merely a prelude to its answer. The great metamorphoses of capitalism that have taken place since the discovery of electro electromagnetism. But I must ask for your patience just a little more. First, I need to get something off my chest. Upon hearing your question, I felt a tinge of sadness. For the first time, you were no longer confidently instructing me explaining how technological changes shattered the existence of social order, propelled history, and endangered progress. Accompanied by Hesoid-like lamentations of what had been lost. No, suddenly you were asking me 
to explain the technological and social transformation to you. The inexplicable sadness begins to make sense. The question, did the internet do to capitalism what which iron's magic had done to prehistory, or did it render capitalism invincible? It's just not hard to answer. The responsibility of answering it marked a rite of passage, a final curtain of a blessed childhood. It put the onus on me to carry forward your method of thinking. Now, let me try to do that. Know that, even though it gave capitalism a breathtaking boost for a couple of decades, the internet did not render capitalism invincible. But nor did it prove on its own its Achilles heel, as I initially suggested. What the internet did to capitalism was more subtle. In conjunction with the attention market that the textual structure had fabricated, and under circumstances created by the Minotaur's spectacular rise, not to mention its 2008 fall, the internet shattered capitalism's revolution, evolutionary sorry, uh, fitness. And as I shall explain in the next chapter, it did this by incubating a new form of capital, which was ultimately empowered its owners to break free of capitalism and become a whole new ruling class of their own. Yes, capital still exists and flourishes, even though capitalism does not. None of this ought to surprise you. After all, it was what you taught me. As consecutive mutations multiply the variants of an organism until at some point a brand new species appears, so technological changes proceeds within a social system until suddenly the system has been transformed into something quite distinct, though that doesn't mean at all of the materials out of which the system is built, capital, labor, and money, have necessarily changed. Improvements in navigation and shipbuilding did not end feudalism on their own. However, when the resulting trade volumes and accumulated merchant wealth reached a critical mass, they triggered the commodification of land, then of labor, soon after almost everything. Before anyone knew it, feudalism had morphed into capitalism. Similarly, with the technostructure which contained markets during and after the war with Don Draper's Mad Men, who turned our attention into a vital commodity, and, which, and with the Nixon shock, whose demolition of the global plan enabled Wall Street's mad numbers to fund the rise of the Minute War. None of these developments overthrew capitalism, but can be thought as a mutation in its DNA that led to a series of remarkable metamorphoses as it adapted and evolved, like a virus facing a miscell miscellany of vaccines. But there comes a time when something has evolved so much that it is possibly best to call it something else. Before we delve into capitalism's final metamorphosis into what I call techno-feudalism, it is perhaps apt to dedicate a few final words to the global minotaur, the metamorphical beast standing in for the US-centered global recycling system, which between the late 1970s and 2008 deliver delivered all the props of our present drama big finance, big tech, neoliberalism, industrial scale inequality, not to mention democracy so atrophied that films like Don't Look Up are necessary to explain humanity's paralysis in the face of climate catastrophe. So here comes the briefest of eulogies. The Cretan Minotaur was slain by an Athenian prince, Theusus. In death ended prehistory and ushered in the classical era of tragedy, history, philosophy. Our era's minotaur died less heroically, a victim of cowardly Wall Street bankers whose hubris was rewarded with massive state bailouts that did nothing to resuscitate the minotaur. For while the American deficit returned with a vengeance a year after the crash of 2008 and subsequent bankers' bailouts, it never restored the beast's capacity to recycle the world's profits. True, the rest of the world continued to send most of its profits to Wall Street, but the recycling mechanism was broken. Only a small fraction of its of the monies rushing to Wall Street returned in the form of tangible investments into factories, technologies, agriculture. Most of the world's money rushed to Wall Street to stay in Wall Street. There it sloshed around doing nothing useful. As it piled up, it bid up share prices, thus giving the Jills and Jacks of finance yet another opportunity to do stupid things at a mammoth scale. Some of us had dared to hope that the Minotaur's passing might help us build a new system where wealth no longer needs poverty to flourish and development is thought of in terms of better rather than more. 
Those of a hyper-optimistic deposition went as far as to dream of a day when exploitation withered, politics was democratized, perhaps even with the help of the internet, and our environment's resilience triumphed other priorities. Such hope faded after 2009, and although for some they were revived during the big crisis, the pandemic, it was not to be. Our Minotaur will, in the end, be remembered as a sad, boisterous beast whose 30-year reign created and then destroyed the illusion that capitalism can be stable, greed a virtue and finance productive. By dying, it forced capitalism into its last and fatal metamorphosis, birthing a system where power is in the hands of even fewer individuals who own a brave new type of capital. With that, we have come to an end of the second chapter. That was uh, quite a long episode. I don't remember exactly how long the last episode was, but this one is pretty much as long. Um, that was a very interesting chapter, uh, kind of going through the, you know, the, the 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 evolution of capitalism, primarily after the the world wars, is very interesting to see. I didn't know a, a lot about it, these things. Of course, I have a general understanding of politics, but I don't know like these specific historical facts because you know, generally speaking, they're not really taught in school or anything. So people don't really understand how exactly, for example, how Europe and Japan was financed by essentially finance or given money by the US to rebuild. Like most people know that, but they don't know the the underlying history of it and, and kind of the the wacky and goofy shit that America did uh, to to sustain that practice and how it then eventually backfired because honestly yeah, capitalism is just an unstable, you know, system. And no matter how much you try to make it work, it is at the end of the day, not a great system. And as you know, as you try to deregulate more and do all these different things to basically bring back the, the greatness of America, or as um, Reagan himself said, make America great again. Yeah, he also said that just like Trump has said in, in, the, in, in the present. Yeah, he was already on that gibberish, on that s sort of rhetoric. So it's interesting to to see, you know, the history, the as Giannis himself puts, the metamorphosis of capitalism throughout the last what thirty, fifty, you know, along he he talked about. Mostly, it's also interesting to see the origin of neoliberalism, which I, you know, of course have talked about previously on the podcast, for example, and it's something that I'm aware of. I didn't quite understand how it was birthed and the in the in the conditions, the material conditions behind its birth, and kind of how how now it's. The, my view of it is that it's even more pathetic than I already thought it was, which is impressive. <laughs> that my opinion on neoliberalism has somehow become worse after reading that. So yeah, that's interesting. Uh, of course, next week we will be we'll be getting into the uh, chapter called Cloud Capital, which is where Yannis, I believe, will start actually explaining what Cloud Capital is, which I think by the name, most of you can guess what it is about, uh, you know, regarding the, the present of, of our lives and how the internet works. I think that you can make an educated guess. But if you want to read that, of course, you have to wait for next week or if it's been a week already, the video is already out. So go check that one out. Anyways, of course, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to support us over on Patreon. If you can support us over on Patreon, make sure to check out our website on how you can support us through alternative ways. Um, if you do join our Patreon, also make sure to join our public Discord server because you'll get access to some special perks. And of course, joining our Discord server, you can just generally talk to us and and uh, you know talk to the Paul Time team. And then of course, finally, you know, follow us on our social media platform so that you can see our latest news and, and interact with us maybe in a more direct way. Or, you know, whatever. We, we just like to update our, our viewers uh, on our social media platform. So it's always good to you know, follow us there to keep sure that you're getting the latest news all the time from Pod Time. And with that being said, I have nothing more to offer you today. So I'll see you all in the next episode of Pod Time Reads. Goodbye, everybody.